Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is lecture 1L. We're going to talk about the very important concept of homology. We'll talk about its meaning in biology and we'll particularly apply it to genetics. We'll talk about how to decide if similarities are due to homology or due to other factors. And we'll talk about the specific genetic case of homologous chromosomes. Now, I'll start with a little justifications for why we talk about evolution a lot in a genetics course. Um, the quote is from a noted geneticist, Theodosius Dobzhansky, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. This is particularly true for genetics. Heritable genetic variation is what genetics is about, but it's also what evolution is about, since Heritable genetic variation is what makes evolution possible, allows natural selection, and it's what natural selection acts on, and it's what has evolved. So all of the features of the genetic systems that we study are the products of evolution. So we're very much embedded within an evolutionary world, as is all biology. Now, homology is often confused with similarity. And that's because homology is a special kind of similarity. Lots of things are similar. Things that are homologous are similar because of shared ancestry. So here are examples of the four limb bones of four different vertebrate species, starting with the human arm bone. And they've been colored to show up their similarities. So there's the upper arm bone is a big bone. Then the lower arm, our forearm, has two bones. Then there are the small bones of the wrist and the long bones of our fingers. And we see similar arrangements of bones in the forelimbs of all other vertebrates. And this is because the ancestor of all these vertebrates had a limb with this structure. This is called the tetrapod limb. So it's shared ancestry that has given us these similar features. Shared ancestry also applies to the genes that are responsible for the development of these features. For instance, here we're comparing the um, genes that control embryonic development in a fruit fly and in a mouse. And the genes are colored according to their function and positioned according to their arrangement on the chromosome. And we see that the genes are similarly colored for similar parts of the embryo, and they're arranged similarly on the chromosomes. They also, although you don't see that here, they have similar sequences. And we now know that genes like this control embryonic development in all animals, and that these genes are similar because they are descended from a common ancestor of all animals that controlled its development with these genes. We can extend the comparison farther to look at individual sequences. Here are the amino acid sequences of two genes. One gene is the eyeless gene of fruit flies. When this gene is defective, the fly doesn't have any eyes. The other is a gene that was studied completely independently in humans. It's responsible for a disease called aniridia, which is the hereditary absence of eyes. Once these sequen genes were sequenced and compared, it was astonishing to see how similar these sequences are. The red amino acids are the ones that are different. Almost everything else about these sequences is identical. And this level of similarity must be due to common ancestry. And this tells us that the ability to develop an eye, although the types of eyes are very different, in fruit flies and humans, that the ability to develop an eye is an ancestral feature that was controlled by this gene in the common ancestor of all animals, in particularly humans and fruit flies. Now, not all similarity is due to homology. That's part of why there's this confusion. Similarity can simply be due to chance. This is especially true for relatively simple features. For example, if we're comparing just short segments of two DNA sequences, we'll often find short strings of bases that are the same. 
simply by chance, with no evolution or ancestry involved. Um, similarity can also arise on independent pro features that become similar because natural selection is selecting for the same function. Um, here we see two animals. This is the Australian echidna. Its closest relative is, its only close relative is the platypus. It lays eggs. This is the mammal, European mammal, the hedgehog. Both of these animals eat insects, and both of them have transformed their fur coats into spines. We know that this is not homologous because we know a great deal about the ancestors of echidnas and the ancestors of hedgehogs, and they don't have spines. They have independently been selected for spiny coats as a form of defense. Finally, homo um, sim whoops, similarity can be due to common ancestry, the kind of homology that I described in the previous slide. Now, how do we decide whether similarity is really due to shared ancestry? The answer is, it's not always obvious, but usually we have a lot of other information. Um, the general principles are, if the similarities are so strong that they couldn't have arisen by chance, for instance, the similarity between the Aniridia gene and the Eilis gene that I showed you, and they're too arbitrary to have arisen by convergent evolution, that is, the similarities extend to features that would not be acted on by natural selection, then we infer that these similarities must have arisen because of divergence from a common ancestor, and that is, they must be due to homology. Now, once we've decided that features are homologous, we can use them to tell us more about evolutionary processes. And this is particularly true for DNA sequences. Once we've decided that DNA or protein sequences are homologous, there's a lot of other information in there that lets us make evolutionary inferences. The simplest of which is how, knowing how similar two homologous sequences are tells us how recent their common ancestor was. So here's homologous sequences from three different species. And we see that the first two species differ only at two positions. So we infer they had a very recent common ancestor. However, sequence two and sequence three are much more different. They're different there, 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 there. And we infer that sequence three has a more distant ancestor from sequence two than sequence one does. We'll talk more about this in module two. Now, in genetics, homology is used in a particular way in one particular case. It's used generally in genetics, but in particular, it's used in the term homologous chromosomes. It's really the same meaning that homologous has everywhere else, similarly due to shared ancestry, but it particularly applies to the two versions that we have of each of our chromosomes. So our chromosome 7 for mom and our chromosome 7 for dad are referred to as homologous chromosomes. They are, of course, truly homologous because the reason they're so similar is because they're descended from very recent common ancestors, not species way back in evolutionary time, but humans who were our ancestors maybe only a few thousand years ago. So they're very similar because they share very recent common ancestry, and we refer to the different versions of, our, of any particular chromosome that humans have as being homologous chromosomes. Now, here's a question for you. Which of these pairs of entities are homologous? And I'll just point out one thing about this question, which is that the answer boxes are square. Now, you might think, nah, they just picked squares instead of circles. But in fact, in Coursera and in many other multiple choice situations, square answer boxes have a special significance. They mean that this is a question that where there may be more than one correct answer, and that you will be able to check more than one box in your answers. 